Well, hey guys, and welcome to Church Online this week, and uh, I hope that you all are super, super well. I hope everything's going great in your life, and uh, it really is so good to have you join us online this week. And a couple of things up front before I get into the word. Firstly, uh, for the faithful and the regulars who are on every week here, you would have noticed a couple of things. Firstly, there was no Church Online last week, and uh, huge apologies for that. I actually got really, really sick last week and so we wanted to shift things around we had a guest speaker come in in Maritzburg uh, and I wanted to make sure that I continued with this series uh, myself because it's it's something that's so important to me at the moment um, that we're busy doing um, and I wanted to do that online and I wanted to do that in person as well so uh, with the guest speaker Scotty came in last week in Maritzburg filling in for me live and uh, we thought we would just give last week a break and then we're back into the series again this week. I am much better. I had COVID and I was very, very sick. I was, I was really man down for like three, four days and we're about a week, uh, we're about a week later since I got COVID. Still feeling a little bit sick and um, uh, not 100%, quite tired and sort of fatigued. So I would really appreciate your prayers. Um, but definitely much better than I was. Praise God for that. So we're getting there. But, but, but. Um, and the other thing is that we have chatted a lot about the way that we're going to do online and how we're going to bring it to you guys going forward and, and really try to analyze as best as we can who watches this. Um, you know, why, why, why would we keep doing this every single week? It is some work for us and exactly how we should present it. And so what we decided to do is we're actually going to, and you would have seen it already from today, we're going to start separating the message from the worship. So we're going to we're going to kind of put a worship playlist together within YouTube. I want to help you with this because it's really easy to do. So if you go in, in, onto our YouTube account and you go onto playlists, you'll see there there'll be a playlist called worship. And uh, we're kind of going to leave it up to you guys now in terms of um, getting into what, having some worship songs whenever you can. Uh, there's various reasons why people watch online. Um, you know, some people are kind of committed to it. Uh, maybe they can't be in person um, for extended period of time for some reason, and they really still want to feel like they're part of the community, want to stay part of it. They want to bring the message and the worship into their home. So we want to co continue to, to uh, give that opportunity to people. The other major reason why people watch online is when they miss church on a Sunday. And uh, we kind of realize that for a lot of people, they want to listen to the sermon. And, uh, and sometimes the worship is important, but sometimes, um, you know, having the option to be able to separate those two really helps. And so we're going to have a playlist on YouTube now where you'll be able to go and you'll be able to select which song you want to worship to, either in your car or at home or wherever you consume the content. And then separately to that, every week what we'll do is we'll bring the sermon to you this way and, uh, and you'll be able to, to catch up if you've missed it. And, and get straight into the sermon if you need to. It does help us a little bit from an editing perspective um, and putting it all together. It kind of streamlines the process a bit and I really think that it'll help you as well. So I just wanted to explain that so everybody understood what we're doing. I want to make sure we keep everybody up to date with the, 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 the messages that we're bringing that we really believe are on our hearts. And well done for all of you guys that are, are tuning in and we want to make it as easy as possible to do. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into this week's message because Really, uh, and that's the reason why I paused this last week, is that this is a message that has been, is so important to me right now. So we started a series uh, th three weeks ago now, and this is the third installment of it, called The Holy Bible. And uh, really, I believe that we're living in a day and age, and we're actually moving towards a situation that is probably going to keep progressing in, in the way that we have seen it progress over the last little while. And that is that people are, are already starting to deconstruct the Bible. They're starting to take it apart. They're starting to kind of uh, pick and choose which pieces they, 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 they want to believe, which pieces they don't want to believe, which pieces they th say have some kind of um, moral ground or authority to speak into our lives and which don't. And really, guys, you know, the, 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 the reality is we can kind of expect that from people that are not Christians. I think that's always going to happen. It, and as we go through the material today, you'll see that it has always happened in the past. It's probably going to keep happening. I remember when I was at school 20 years ago now um, and, uh, and, and had an English teacher that, that really did uh, belittle the Bible quite a lot. And, um, and she, was just, she was just an atheist. She just didn't believe in God. She, she, she didn't believe in, in, in what we believe in. And in many ways, we can expect that. But what's really been sad over the last little while that we've seen, I think for the first time, maybe on, a, on the scale that we've seen it, is that Christians and churches and preachers are starting to deconstruct the Bible and kind of pick and choose which parts 
we're going to follow and, and you know which parts we aren't and I just want to say loud and clear right up front that that's not going to be our position we, we're going to stand very very firmly on what we believe the word of God says the way as best as we are able to interpret it preach it as accurately as possible as we possibly can and so today what I, then is really what this whole series has been all about is, is really reaffirming um, our love and our commitment to the word of God and so, um, you know, this is super important for me because all the messages coming up, all the series that we've got planned, everything we're going to be bringing you guys, everything we're going to teach you guys, if we don't settle this first, really, um, you know, we, we, we're kind of standing on shaky ground. And we want every single person to build their lives on solid ground, especially as the times that we live in seem to get more and more funky all the time. And so today, um, what I want to talk about is, is I want to talk about how the Bible is not just... Um, it's not just right and, and, and kind of has good principles to it, but actually that it's also accurate, that the Bible is really accurate and the, that the Bible can be trusted. And so today I actually want to look at some, some I'm going to look at seven different um, facts that really prove, I believe, conclusively that the Bible can be trusted in its entirety, in the way that it's written, in the way that it's been given to us, that we can actually trust it. And um, I read just this week, you know, t t talking about the Bible and how, how important it is, guys, that we build the word into our lives and we get it in and we allow it to achieve the work that it's, that it's got in our lives. I read a study just this week that said that for people that read the Bible three days or less a week, there's almost no effect on your life. So, th so they can't really measure any kind of um uh, uh, visible or tangible uh, effect on reading the Bible three or less days a week. But has has an incredible stat. The moment you go from four up, so the minute you do four or more times a week, the more you, the, the, the minute you read the Bible four or more times a week, suddenly the stats go through the ceiling. There's all sorts of benefits that they found, and just a few that that I found so interesting were that feelings of loneliness are down by 33% if you read the Bible four times or more. Feel it, this, the feeling of loneliness, like I'm all alone, is down 33% if you read the Bible four times or more. Uh, feelings of bitterness, uh, bitterness in relationships and, and unforgiveness is down 40%. Kind of feeling like, you know, these relationships are, are, are really sour in my life. And those feelings go down 40% if you read the Bible four times or more a week. Sexual lust and temptation down 60% if you read the Bible four more times a, a week. And so really, when we say that the Bible is living and active and it's transformative and it has a way of getting into our lives and, and doing the most remarkable things, these stats really prove it. And, the, and the really, that's what this series is all about, renewing our love for the Word of God once more and allowing God to do the work that He needs to in our lives. And next week, I can't wait to bring you that message. I'm really going to talk about how the Word impacts us, how it changes our lives. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell, dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it be something that you don't just kind of read it and walk away and forget about it. You read it, you take it in, you think about it, it, it gets into your life and it dwells richly. And so um, the key scripture for today that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna kind of base this whole sermon on is from Matthew 24, verse 35. It says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. Everything that we're seeing is moving, it's shifting, it will pass away. But my words will never pass away. And the Bible is something we can build our lives on. So seven evidences or facts or, or uh, uh, reasons that we can trust the Bible, that we can trust that what is there is trustworthy. And, the, f and the, the, the first thing is that the Bible is historically accurate. The Bible is historically accurate. And a lot of people, as I said earlier, are kind of, we're living at a day and age where they're wanting to deconstruct and reconstruct and pull pieces out of the Bible. And I've even found that amongst pastors, and this is crazy, but a lot of people believe this, that the principles in the Bible are good and you can follow the principles and say, you know, the Bible gives us almost like some people call it a manual for life. And what they mean by that, you know, there's a good side of that. But what they can mean by that 
is that there's good principles to follow and the things in there that, that are good principles, but the stories in there, the things that happen aren't actually true. They're just images and pictures and none of those things actually happen, but we need to take the principle out. I just want to tell you that I think that if people think like that, they've actually got a problem with their faith. You know, people will say things like, it's not scientifically accurate or it's not, um, it's not feasible, for example, that Jonah was in the whale, the belly of a fish for three days. Some people say, it's not possible that he lived. And, that's a, and so we should, it's something like that. We should rather see it as an, as an image than a physical thing that happened. I just want to tell you guys that if, you, if we're thinking like that, there's probably something wrong with our faith. Because, guys, it's not physically possible for a virgin to, to, to give birth. It's not physically possible for the dead to be raised. It's not physically possible for the, the Red Sea to be parted. There's a whole bunch of things that are not physically possible that we believe happened. And so, um, really, if we're going to start picking and choosing, we're going to get ourselves into some, some dangerous ground. Psalm 33 verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. The word of the Lord is both right and and true, there's principles in there, of course, that we can live by and that we should see how God worked and, 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 and really, uh, you know, adapt to, to suit our lives. But it's also true and it's also right. And so um, how do you know if something is historically accurate? Well, there actually are. There, there's a way that you can gauge if, some, if, if, if uh, ancient texts that were written are historically accurate. And the way that they do this, historians use a standard where they, they um, apply these three standards to something as, as a proof to see if it really is historically correct. And obviously, um, it's all, sort of like a scale. So the, the, the more these standards apply, the more correct it is. And so the first standard that they apply is, are there eyewitness accounts? So with an ancient text or something that happened like that, was it just copied and written down kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 in, a, in an oral way where it was written down kind of... Uh, passed on orally from one generation to the next and written down and copied? Or, or were there eyewitness accounts within the, the text itself that were there when those things happened? That's a massive, massive deal. Um, so, so rather than just being kind of like broken down telephones and people that uh, heard that this thing happened and passed the story on someone else, did the person who write it down, w w was that person physically there to see it with their own eyes? Now, in the Bible, it is overwhelmingly written in such a way that the people who were there at the time wrote down the accounts. In fact, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you may not know this or not, but there are four different accounts of the life of Jesus Christ. And all four of these guys were eyewitness accounts right there when all of these things happened. And by the way, they didn't collaborate on these four different Gospels and kind of said, well, let's, what are you writing in verse, you know, in chapter five, I'll write that. These guys all wrote their own separate kind of version of, of the same thing that happened. And they match perfectly. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John match perfectly with the story of Jesus Christ. There's an overwhelming amount of uh, uh, people that, that, that wrote the Bible that were right there when it happened. The second standard that they used is that was it recorded and copied with extreme care. Now, this is a big deal for a lot of people. They think that the Bible was kind of written down a long time ago and it's been copied and copied over the years and uh, the manuscripts and you know it's kind of like uh, it gets weakened every single time diluted every time it's copied and how do we know we can trust the original ones well i think personally it's the reason why god entrusted the jewish people with the word in the first place with the old testament and 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 with writing it down because they are known historically to be the most particular and meticulous copiers and scribes of literature that I think this world has ever seen. In fact, the first five books of the Bible we call the Torah, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The scribes at that time would know the Torah off by heart. Okay, They would copy from, from the original. And by the way, when they copied, they didn't copy and then copy a copy and then copy a copy. They would always keep going back to the original. And the way that they would do it was they wouldn't just copy it word by word, like I read, read a word, yeah, copy it, yeah. They would do it letter by letter. And of those first five books in the Bible of the Torah, they knew the count of the amount of letters in the Torah altogether, what, how many letters there would be. And get this, guys, they knew the middle letter 
right in the middle of the five books. And you, this was the middle one. And once they had finished a copy, they would count the letters both ways. So they would count back and it would count forward from the middle. And if that count didn't line up to what the original was supposed to be and the number was supposed to be, they would throw the whole thing out. All of that work, gone. It wasn't like we were just... You sort of add something in and just abbreviate it. It was gone. The whole the whole thing was was, was chucked out. They were incredibly meticulous. And actually, what, what's happened in history? You may have heard of this or not, but the Dead Sea Scrolls. Go go and study this if you, if you want. It's, it's fascinating. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in nineteen forty in the nineteen forty nine. I think forty eight. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found initially, and kind of uh, and a whole bunch were found after that. And um, at that point, they were dated back to being the oldest manuscripts that we have of the Old Testament. And, uh, and get this, guys. So, so, so basically, our Bible had been written, you know, um, we, we had other manuscripts. The Old Testament had been put in place. Everything was there. And they found these Dead Sea Scrolls, which were dated back to older than the current uh, oldest manuscripts that we had. And get this, it lined up letter for letter with what we have as well. So these even older ones that were found lined up letter for letter. So point number two, recorded and copied with great care. There can be no doubt when you study this historically that the Bible is the most accurately recorded and, uh, and, 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 and copied um, uh, of any ancient writing that we have. Te you, you go and study this stuff. It's called textual criticism. And, uh, and it stands far and above anything else that we have. The third thing that they use... <clears throat> the third and final one to, to tell something's historically accurate was archaeological confirmation. So this is an interesting one. Basically, you know, there would have to be uh, arche archaeological digs and finds of artifacts and instruments and things like that that, that would uh, uh, prove that this, this, the civilizations and the empires and the people groups that you found in the writing, that there's actually physical evidence that those people existed. And every single people group, every single empire, everything written in the Bible that, that we, we, we have, we have archaeological evidence for. And there was one that was missing for 1,900 years, 1,900 years. There was one people group, and it was the Hittites, um, the Hittite Empire, that there was no archaeological evidence for. And uh, some people kind of felt like, well, you know, maybe the Bible missed it on that one. Well, guess what? You guessed it. In the 1900s, uh, they found... Uh, there was an archaeological dig and they, f they found evidence of the Hittite group. There is now every single people group in the Bible has been accounted for. So firstly, the Bible is historically accurate. Why can the Bible be trusted? It's historically accurate. Secondly, the Bible is scientifically accurate. Now, this is a big one for a lot of people. They think that the Bible isn't scientifically ac accurate. And we we're living in a day and age where we've heard over... Um, the last little while, how many times have you heard this phrase? Just trust the science. Just trust the science. <laughs> trust the science. And we know that actually science changes. Science evolves. And um, uh, things that I, when I went to, to university, I did a computer course. Now, let me just tell you, that was, you know, 20, uh, 18 years ago, or whatever it was, that I, did, that I did a computer course. I don't think there would be a single thing that then that I did in, in, in my computer course that I did, probably just to get the credit, that would actually be applicable to, uh, to today's day and age. And what they used to call computer science really doesn't even apply anymore because the science evolves, it changes, and human beings become more uh, clever as, as time goes on. We kind of build on things that we have from the past, and things change. As Psalm 145, 5-6 to six, says this, it says, Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for He issued His command, and they came into being. So he issued his command, they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. And there's things that God has built into this earth that he's put in place that will never, ever be revoked. And even though science changes, we're finding out that over the years, there is so many occasions that eventually the Bible is actually proved correct. That people didn't believe something at, at a certain point, and then they did. And, you know, you would think that... Um, for a book that was written over 1,600 years, that there would be something that needs to be corrected as time goes on. And yet, there isn't. In fact, the exact opposite is true. So you can go nowadays, and I've been to the, the Louvre before in, uh, uh, in, in, in Paris, and you can go there right now, and there are 5.6 kilometers okay, of science books that are now obsolete. 
that through all of the ages and through all of the years, there were things that people believed um, that they wrote down in these great science books that are now completely obsolete. And actually one of those it was written um, in, in 1861, which really, if you think about it, is not that long ago, guys. 1861, um, by the French Academy of Science. And it, the, the book is called, you can go to the Louvre today and you can read, you can see this book. It's called 51 Incontrovertible Scientific Facts That Prove the Bible is Wrong. And guess what? All 51 of those are not controverted. <laughs> All 51 of those scientific facts that prove that the Bible is wrong have been disproved. And they, along with 5.6 other kilometers of books, have now been shown over the years as our science has evolved. We've seen that the Bible actually knew what it was talking about. Now, here's a very interesting thing with the Bible, and I find this absolutely fascinating. Not only has, over the years, over the decades, has science caught up with what the Bible says, but over all of those decades, there were uh, opinions and there were beliefs that were, scientific beliefs that were held that never crept into the Bible. And you think to yourself, if, if, if the Bible was, was something that was just written by man, it was just kind of written in the, in the context of the day and age, how are all of these scientific things that the people really believed fully as in the wisdom of the day, not a single one of those crept into the Bible and gave us something that, that is not true. And so um, I'll give you a few. For 2,000 years, people believed that the earth was flat. And you still get some pretty interesting people nowadays that believe that the earth is flat. But for 2,000 years, that was the commonly held belief, that the earth wasn't, wasn't round, it was flat. And of course, we know Copernicus, Galileo, uh, Columbus, um, they theorized that at a certain point that the earth was round and, uh, and, and you know, eventually sailed off and realized they didn't fall off the end of the earth. But all of these guys had to do was go back 2,000 years and read the Bible. Because as Isaiah 40 verse 22 says this, it says, God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. That word circle is the Hebrew word for sphere, where we get the word globe from and Isaiah it's right there that God sits enthroned above the globe the circle the sphere of the earth I'll give you another one it was a, a completely a common belief a scientific fact held for many many decades that the earth had to be held up and of course the, the the Greeks believed that the earth had to be held up it was, was held up on Atlas's shoulders the, um, the Hindus believed that the earth, was hel- uh, w- the earth was on top of an elephant and the elephant uh, stood on top of a sea turtle and the sea turtle stood on top of a snake. And that this is really true. And the snake swerved through the sea. And the Egyptians, who, by the way, Moses studied under, so he would have gone to an Egyptian university. And these guys, we still today marvel at some of the things that the Egyptians were able to do with the pyramids and the engineering and, um, and how clever these guys really were. But the Egyptians believed that the, the earth was held up on five pillars. That, that was just, that, they were taught that, that was the scientific belief of the, of, of the day. And yet again, this never crept into the Bible. All, all these guys had to do was go and read the oldest book in the Bible, which as uh, Graham looked at a, a, a couple of weeks ago, the, um, the, the oldest book in, in the Bible, because it's not chronological, it's not Genesis, it's actually Job. And in Job, it says he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He sp- suspends the earth over nothing. He suspends the earth over nothing. How on earth did Job know that? How did Job know that God, that the earth is not, is not uh, held up by anything? It's suspended in space. How did he know that? Well, I want to submit to you that maybe Job didn't write the Bible. Maybe God wrote the Bible. I'll give you one more because I I just find this stuff absolutely fascinating. Um, For many, many years, it was believed that the stars in the skies could be counted. And actually, um, uh, in 150 BC, uh, Hippicus, I think that's how you say his name, um, counted the stars in 150 BC. And uh, he, he said that there were 1,022 stars in the sky. <laughs> so 150 BC, he counted the stars and said there were uh, 1,022. And then uh, Ptolemy, uh, he, he came along 300 years later in 150 AD. And he said, no, 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 you, you were wrong. 
um, you, you, you got it wrong. There, wait, there are 1,026, you missed four. You see, he's still there, he's counting the stars. It said you missed four. Now, of course, today, in today's day and age, we think it's absolutely crazy. And actually, I Googled this this week. And according to Google, there are 200 billion trillion stars in the universe. Okay, and I don't know whether anybody's actually counted that or how they got to that point. But basically, the stars cannot be counted. And all these guys had to do was go to Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, it says, the stars of the sky cannot be counted. Stars of the sky cannot be counted. The wisdom of the day, the scientific facts of the day that never, ever crept into the Bible. How is this possible? Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 12, verse 6. And the words of the Lord are flawless. They are flawless. Like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. So the third thing is that the Holy Bible, and this to me is actually one of the most amazing out of all of these seven facts that we're going to look at. But the Holy Bible is prophetically accurate. Now, there's no other book that has, uh, that's been written that within itself contains prophecies about it, uh, that it's going to fulfill later on within the body of writing. I mean, think about that, guys. Every other ancient writing that's, be, that, that's been uh, written um, wouldn't dare to kind of go that far. And uh, <coughs> think about how risky this actually is. Because all that had, had to happen is that you prove one of these things, one of these is not true, and then somebody can disprove the whole Bible. But there are more than a thousand prophecies in the Scripture. There are 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ alone within the Bible. Okay, And these are very specific prophecies. These are not like, uh, he was going to be a nice guy, and uh, he, he was going to be a you know a, a good person, and all this kind of stuff. These are really specific things. Like he was going to ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to be crucified. That he was going to be born in Bethlehem. That he was going to be raised in Nazareth. That he would uh, that he would flee to Egypt. There were a whole bunch of things that were absolutely impossible for Jesus to have been. Uh, kind of at some point decide he was going to start trying to fulfill prophecy. There were many about his birth. There were many about his death. It's too late to get halfway through your life and go, I need to try and fulfill a prophecy that's written in the scripture about me when this thing concerns the way that you were born or the way that you grew up. And um, many, many other prophecies within the Bible. One of the craziest prophecies to me is that David in the Psalms, prophesies about the crucifixion okay the crucifixion hadn't been invented yet so david prophesies about the way that someone was going to die the way that the messiah was going to die in a form of death that had not yet been invented absolutely amazing again maybe these guys didn't write the bible maybe god was the one who wrote the bible and there's this, um, there's this guy, Dr. Peter Stoner, who he studied probabilities. And, and what he did is he got hundreds of guys together and they worked out what the probabilities would be of um, somebody being able to fulfill the, pro the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. And this is what they came to. They said that the chances of one person fulfilling eight prophecies is one in 10 to the power of 17. So that's 10 with 17 zeros after it can you know how probability works basically if you have a, a jar of tennis balls and you know um, nine of them are, are, are normal tennis ball colors and, and, and you paint one of them red and you shake it around and you put your hand in there and you pick out the, the the red one that would be a one in ten probability that you would be able to pick out that red one well the probability of one person fulfilling just eight prophecies remember there were 300 about christ just a prophecy is one in ten to the power of seventeen. The, the 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 probability of one person fulfilling sixteen prophecies about that, that were written in, in the scriptures is one in ten to the uh, uh, one in ten to the power of forty five. Okay, so ten with forty five zeros. The, the chances of, of a person fulfilling forty eight prophecies again, there's nowhere near three hundred. Is one in ten to the power of one hundred and fifty-seven. So ten with one hundred and fifty-seven zeros. We can't even display that. Okay, it, it's basically completely impossible. And yet, yet Jesus fulfilled three hundred of these.
prophecies. And 2 Peter tells us, gives us the answer to how this could actually be. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried away by the Holy Spirit. The prophecy comes from God. Matthew 26.56 says, but all this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded by the scripture. Revelation 22 verse 6 says, The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, said his angel, sent his angels to show his servants the things that must take place soon. The prophecy comes from God. Number four, the Holy Bible is thematically unified. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but, you know, how, how is it that, that, that a book that was written over a period of 1,600 years in over a dozen just different countries on three different con con continents by 40 different authors in three different languages could have a unified theme? It could have one message. It could have a, a one story that it would tell. All the other ancient writings that we have and all the other religious writings that we have, the Quran was written by one person. The, the writings of Buddha were written by one person. All the other ancient texts were written by one person. So, of course, they have a thematically unified theme. But this, this could not be left to chance. How is it that 40 different authors across three different continents come up with the same unified theme? And that unified theme is about Jesus Christ. Luke 24 verse 27 said this, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in the scriptures concerning himself as Jesus was able to take the scriptures and say, hey, these all these things that are written in the Old Testament, all these things that are written about the lamb, all these things that are, that are written are a shadow. They're a type. They're, they have a unified theme of testifying about me. Jesus Christ is the one that the entire Bible is written about and was written for. And someone years ago said to me, such a good thing. And I'm going to keep saying it to you guys. When you read the Bible, do your best to try and see Jesus on every single page. You see it in humanity's fall, that Jesus loves us in spite of us getting it wrong. You see it in, 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 in ancient civilizations when they went their own way and they, they, they left God. And yet God is still faithful anyway. You can see Jesus, his love, his passion, everything that he is in every single part of the Bible. Number five, the Bible was trusted by Jesus. Now, this might seem like the smallest thing to a lot of people. You say, well, you know, of course, Jesus trusted the Bible. You know, that's not a very good evidence. I personally think this is one of the best evidences for us in the church to say that in this day and age, no matter what we see happen in the future, no matter what we live through, we are going to stand firm on the word of God. Because if Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, if we really said that he is Lord of my life, if we really said that he's the one who has ultimate authority in my life, who is king of my heart, I have to listen to him. What he says goes. And Jesus himself trusted the word of the Lord. Matthew 5 verse 18, Jesus said to you, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, nor the, uh, uh, nor the smallest letter, not the, uh, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus believed in the Bible. Jesus believed that, that every single word that was in the Bible had its place, written by God, and that it was uh, the final authority on everything. You have to ask yourself this question. If you believe what you like in the Bible, but don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible that you trust, but yourself. If you believe what you like in the Bible, but you don't believe what you don't like, then it's not the Bible that you trust, but you trust yourself. You have essentially, your mind and your intellect and, and your study has taken the authority, has taken the place of what the Bible should be in your lives. And I just want to tell you guys that so long as I'm preaching and so long as I'm leading Open Skies PMB, we will always do our best to try and not bring you the opinions and the, 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 the thoughts and and. and um, and, and, and the authority of, of me or of, of any other human being, but really what the word of God says. We've got to let the word, if something's got to change, if something's got to shift, we've got to, we've got to allow ourselves to shift and allow the word to be, um, to be true and, and infallible. Number six, the Holy Bible has survived all attacks. 
So there has never, ever been another book in history that has been attacked like the Bible. The Bible is the most despised, derided, denied, disputed, dissected, debated, outlawed, and destroyed book ever in the history of the world. There is absolutely no question about that. It is more debated. It is more criticized and pulled apart and, 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 and attacked more than any other book in history. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why? People don't, don't, don't face, you know, there's no other uh, historic writing that faces the same kind of scrutiny and, and, and the same kind of uh, attack that the Bible does. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? And over all of the years, there's been so many people that have tried to disprove the Bible. There's a very, very, very clever people, way more clever than me, that have, that have come and that have gone, that have tried to disprove the Bible. And we're living in a day and age now where people still want to debate and want to pull the Bible apart. And I just want you to know that these, these attacks are going to keep coming and they're going to come and they're going to go. Uh, there was a French philosopher in the 18th century, a very, very smart guy called Voltaire. Okay. And uh, this very clever guy, this French philosopher said that within a hundred years, the Bible will be forgotten. And the only thing forgotten is that quote. No one even knows that quote anymore. Within a hundred years, the Bible will be forgotten. And actually, um, it's a it's a super funny story because what happened was this Voltaire a philosopher, when he died, the Bible Society and uh, the French Bible Society actually bought his house. And today, it's the headquarters for the French Bible Society, which I just think is hilarious. A guy that said within a hundred years, the Bible would be forgotten. It cannot be forgotten. It will not be forgotten because the word of the Lord is true. 1 Peter 1 verse 24 to 25 says, The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of the Lord endures forever. There are going to be people that are going to attack it. There are going to be people that are going to come against it. They're going to try and disprove it, but they will never be able to because the word of the Lord endures forever. So the question you've got to ask yourself today is, Will I attack the word of God or will I live by it? If something needs to shift, if something needs to change, if I read something that I don't like, if I read something and I look at my life and I go, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't like that because my life doesn't look like that. Am I going to change or am I going to try and change the Bible to try and suit me and try and fit my life? Will I deconstruct it or will I defend it? And as time goes on, I think God is going to require us more and more that we say we know what we believe. And we're willing to defend it. Will I follow the word of God or will I follow, sorry, will I fo follow the word of God or will I follow the world? Which one am I going to follow? And I just want you guys to know that there is no ways I am budging. And you might say, what happens if they change laws? And well, they'll have to lock me up. I will continue to preach the word of God so long as there's breath in my lungs and God gives me the ability to. I will continue to preach the word of God. Number seven and the last one, and this is the most amazing one. Because all of these things are, are, are scientific and historic and, and all these kind of things. And we can, you know, examine facts and look at all these things. But this is actually one that you can test in your own life. And I think that this is what God would be asking you today. I think that this would be the invitation to you in your life today. And that is that we believe the word of God is true because it has life-changing power. That your own testimony can prove whether the word of God is true or not. Hey, let me just ask you this. When last did you get confronted with a scripture that you went, that's confronting, that's difficult. But I'm going to make a change in my life and I'm going to apply this. And I'm not just going to see this as a good principle to live by, but I'm going to see this as the authority in my life. That actually, God, if my life doesn't match up to that, then something's got to shift here. Something's got to change. Because let me just tell you that I absolutely guarantee you, I guarantee you, that if we do that, that we will be better off for it. There isn't a single thing in the Bible that if we do it and we live by it, no matter how difficult it may be, that doesn't result in our benefit and us being closer to God and us being closer to the people that he's called us to be, have the depth and the love of relationships that he wanted us to have. And, and we've got to decide whether we're going to choose pleasure and we're going to choose selfishness and we, whether we're going to choose uh, you know to 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 um to fold and to and, and to allow ourselves to go our own way rather than allowing the corrective voice of the word of the word of god in our lives that is genuinely for our benefit john 8 
31 said this, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, if you hold on to it, not just read it and kind of walk away, not take bits and pieces of it when you feel like it, but if you hold on to it, in fact, one version says, if you cling tightly to it, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is the invitation that God gives us. Let's not be a generation. Let's not be a group of people. And I'm telling you, in this church, we never, from our side, we never will be. Who deconstruct and reconstruct and pick and choose pieces that we like. We say, God, we're going to hold tightly onto your word. We will know the truth and the truth will set us free. And so I'm going to end kind of with a prayer today. And I'm going to um, sort of pray it over you. And, uh, and, and I'll encourage you to, to, um, to listen to this and, and to allow this prayer to be real for you today. I'm going to say it out first and then I'm going to pray it so that you know exactly what you're committing to and what you're signing up to. But I think that we need to renew our commitment to the word of God and we need to renew our commitment to its authority and, and say no matter what happens, God, we, every single one of us, we're going to follow what you say in your word above what any man says, above what any popular belief is. We're going to follow your word. So this is the prayer I'm going to pray over you. Dear God, from this day forward, I will accept the Bible as your flawless word to me. And I will make it the final authority for my life. Even when I don't understand it, even when it's not popular, easy, or even when I don't like it. You are God and I am not. Thank you for loving me enough to speak to me through your word. I want to love your word, learn your word, and live your word. Let me pray that over you today. Lord, I pray for every single person that's watching this right now, God, and I pray that the commitment that we would have is that from this day forward, we will accept the Bible as your flawless word to us, that we will make it the final authority in our life. Even when we don't understand it, even when it's not popular, even when it's not easy, or even when we don't like it, Lord, I pray that it would still be the authority over our lives. You are God, and we are not. And so we thank you for loving us enough to speak to us through your word. We want to love your word. We want to learn your word and we want to live your word in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. It's been so good to have you online this week. And uh, next week, we're going to wrap up our last of uh, the four installments of the Holy Bible. Can't wait to do it. Uh, but until then, we hope that you have a fantastic week. If you need anything from us at all, please just uh, send us an email, pmb at openskies.co.za. I would love to hear from you. Um, and if there's anything that you need, we would uh, be more than happy to, to get hold of you and see how we can help with anything. But I um, hope you're all so good and we'll see you soon. God bless everyone. Uh...